Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space for guests to share their stories while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do, do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes, open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for hitting play today. Really excited. We're going to have some fun today. I just, I got a feeling. Isn't that like a Black Eyed Peas song? I got a feeling. How does, how's the rest of that go? Anyone know? Because I'm not really a Black Eyed Peas fan, but I know they made that famous. Enough playing around today. It's time to get serious. We should get serious every now and then. No, that seems silly. I am going to invoke some some real anxiety. I'm going to invoke some Scantron trauma right now in you as we speak. I don't know about anybody else. When I hear the word quiz or test, I immediately palms get sweaty. Mom's spaghetti has definitely been vomited up, quoting Eminem. So don't lose yourself in the moment right now as we move forward into my new friend. And I cannot wait to introduce you because we get to cross off Minnesota off of our list today. So excited. Help me welcome in my new friend, Amanda. Amanda, how are you today? Hey, this is super fun. I'm already excited. This is I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We hosted a bunch of college students at our house last night, so I am tired, but I'm doing well. So my question is, how many shoes have been scattered around said house with the college students? Have you counted them yet? We did not count. I think there were maybe 25 total-ish. We had like football players and volleyball players. It was a lot of fun. That does sound like a lot of fun. It also sounds like chaos. (laughs) in general. It just sounds chaotic. And who's going where and where do they need to go and all of this other stuff. So now help me with this. Are they the Golden Gophers or are you too far away from said Golden Gophers of the University of Minnesota? Yeah, definitely not that cool. So we are, if people maybe have heard of the movie Fargo, we are like an hour uh, southeast. I know you're laughing. Southeast of Fargo. So we are in West Central Minnesota. We're very rural. There is a community college in our community. So that's definitely not the Golden Gophers (laughs) or not at our house last night. Help me with this too, because in 91, I absolutely could not stand the Minnesota Twins. Die hard rooting for the Braves to win. Now, did you care about the Minnesota Twins in 91 or am I the only one that maybe cared? No, I'm really bad with math, but I think I would have been like seven. (laughs) (laughs) I, I was not interested. In the twins, second grade, so... Well, second grade, I still was envisioning being a San Francisco Giant playing first base, taking over for Will Clark, I'm sure in second grade, because I thought I was that good. Little did I know somebody came along to tell me, listen, you're really not that good, Neil. It's just a fantasy. You can be the World Series MVP in your backyard all you want, but that's as far as it's going to go. Sadly, here I am now podcasting. So I I don't know. That seems like a terrible segue. Amanda, help me with this, because I'm really excited to ask this question. What style of shoe do you love to wear? Okay, so in Minnesota, we have all seasons. I prefer to wear a nice but casual boot. Most of the year, half of our year is cold. So like fall and winter and into April, you can wear like a boot, comfortable boot. I'm not a combat bootish kind of boot. That's if you understand what I'm saying. (laughs) That's my go-to. I I grew up with combat boots. My dad wore a few of them and I've laced a few up myself when I'm playing Marine. We didn't play Army. We played Marine. I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, his combat boots were a little different because they're military style. That's what I'm envisioning. So I'm really bad with details. I'm not entirely sure if they're combat boots. They're like comfortable. I'm not really sure how to explain them. They're like a, I don't know. They're like a boot. 
but not fancy. All right. So no Doc Martin. <laughs> Correct. No. I am enamored that we got to connect and, and we got to give some kudos to our good friend, Sarah, who yes. is down in Missouri. And she was on, it seems like an eon ago, time change and the seasons change quite literally. Not only there is time change, there is, we're in a new season and she was in a previous season. And I'm just so thankful for her. She connected us with so many fun folks and you were part of that fun folk connection. And so I want to thank her for that and all that she is a part of and, and what a great talented writer she is. Here's where I'm at. You have this amazing quiz that I just, I want to get to right now. I sent it to three ladies that I know. First lady was my wife. She got it first. And then I had some female coworkers that I'm pretty tight with at work. And both of them are, are in married relationships. And I thought, hmm, okay, let's get a survey says kind of family feud thing going. Let's see what they got. So we'll lead off with my wife, Elizabeth. She got influencer. Okay. My other friend, Tiffany, she also got influencer. So I'm curious to see what these mean. And then my good friend, Michaela, she actually got a different answer than the other two. She got unifier. So I have no idea what these mean. They sent me their results, by the way. So I didn't really read through them. Well, here's why. Kind of on purpose because I wanted you to break that down for me. My hope is at least I'll get three download listens out of this. All three have now been mentioned. So... <laughs> That was my plan. But help me with this. Like, why why the quiz? Why do this? Let's face it. We're, we're in this series, You're Only. And I think so many times, at least the ladies I've been talking to in this series, have struggled on some level with, listen, I'm only ever going to be a mom. I'm only ever going to be a wife. But I feel like women, specifically, this is maybe gets me in trouble. Women have so many different facets to them, like a diamond. And that's why they're a treasure gym to me. And that's why I kind of get a little bugged and a little irritated with men, me being a man saying, well, I'm going to identify as a girl now. And it's like, no, bro, you're not. You don't have the <laughs> facets that women have. So bail me out, Amanda. Help me with this. We are a wife like me.com. If you head over there, you can take this quiz that Neil is talking about. And it's to discover your wife type. And so the quiz came about because there's power in information. When we understand ourselves better, then it helps us understand so many other facets of our world in which we live better. When we understand, oh, this is how... I am created. This is how my brain tends to filter information or receive information. And so when we understand that, then we can use that to our advantage and we can really grow and learn and better and improve our relationships. So the whole point of the quiz is to help us as wives specifically understand what our wife type is. So they're broken out into different categories. The two that you mentioned, influencer is, and, and the cool thing, it, if you read, if you go back after this and read the results that they sent you, it explains the strengths to each and then the weaknesses to each. And then it gives helpful, practical tips. And it also gives like suggested readings, like books to read and dive into to help grow in our strengths and our weaknesses. So like the influencer, for example, would be a wife whose strengths are a communicator, like a clear communicator, unafraid to enter into hard, maybe discussions, knows what she wants, knows what she likes and doesn't like, and isn't afraid to maybe share that <laughs> and direct that. That's a great strength. You are clear in what you like and what you don't like. And you typically are able to communicate that well to other people. So an influencer is tends to be a wife who would, she's running the home, she's kind of directing traffic in a way that everyone knows kind of what is expected of them, good or bad, and is just kind of get get things done. And this is how I know I would like you all to function around me. Obviously, we already know what the weaknesses to that are with just me saying we come across controlling, we can be rude, disrespectful, demeaning. <laughs> I'm an influencer. So I'm just I totally understand. And I empathize with all the influencers out there. I've been married 22 years. What's the right answer to say in this moment? <laughs> So I still stay married. Everything you're mentioning, yeah, absolutely, is my wife. And lately, it seems like we've gotten a little bit of pushback from a girl down the hall that is 16 saying, mom's way too controlling, dad. I'm like, yeah, I know that's one of her best traits. And then I got in trouble for saying that. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, this is so great. Yeah. So are you asking... 
what to do with I'm just you're- asking for a friend. Not me, just a friend of mine. His name's Zach. He's just <laughs> he wrote in, he's like, Neil, I know you're gonna be talking with Amanda. Ask her this question. Here's the deal, like for guys or women listening, we all wanna change our spouse. For anybody that's married, or if you're not, you will want to change your spouse. You will want your spouse. I don't care what kind of person, personality, all the things. It doesn't matter who you are. We all innately want other people to be more like us because then we believe the world would be a whole lot easier. So it doesn't matter what your type is or personality style or communication style or conflict resolution style is. It just, you want your spouse specifically or any, in any relationship, you desire them to be more like you because then it just be a lot easier, but you didn't marry yourself. I could tell you, you could really sit down with your wife and share with her that she, the way she's parenting, the way we're parenting together, maybe perhaps comes across as though we are controlling. Maybe we want to transition into a coaching role with our kids or entering the teenage years instead of telling them what to do. Maybe want to give them more up. I mean, you could like do all that, but it comes down to you and your wife being able to have open communication, a valuable, deep, intimate relationship. Marriage consists of two people who both share and receive hard things. One person isn't able to receive something hard or share something hard. You're not actually going to have a deep, meaningful, intimate relationship. Affirm and encourage you to, or Zach, to communicate with her about, Hey, our, you know, our daughter is actually like feeling like this and encourage your daughter to go to your wife and say, and have them have that direct conversation together. And so that you can share and learn and grow. You don't need to be the mediator between them and yet you can help your wife and your daughter find a common ground there. And did you have other follow-ups to that or? (laughs) I mean, there's probably tons of follow-ups to that. I'm probably also going to get in trouble, but that's okay. (laughs) I mean, Zach will not me. Who am I saying? Like, That wasn't my question. I really was so excited to connect with you because of this reason, because I'm thinking to myself, just again, this is how my creative brain works, is what's the motivation behind Amanda creating this? What spurs, what's the catalyst, what's the genesis, whatever you want to say, fun word there, insert wherever. What brings all this about for you? Got to be a background story. No, I just felt like doing it one day, Neil. It's like, hey, that sounds fun. (laughs) I mean, fine. Sure. Great. I mean, we all have that moment. I'm thinking there's got to be, there's got to be something. Did you in any way feel, listen, I'm not measuring up as a wife. I'm falling short. Like I watch Hallmark movies and I'm like, I can't be her. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I still feel like I don't measure up in any capacity. And I think that's actually like the best part of everything. Cause we're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I don't know what I'm doing. However, when I was five, my parents got divorced. I swore I would never get a divorce myself. When I was 28 in grad school for counseling. I took her two kids and I left my husband. And I was like, I I do not want to be divorced, but I do not know how to be married. And I've tried everything I know how to try. Nothing's working. Where do we go from here? 11-ish years ago, and then maybe about nine-ish years ago, eight, I can't remember. A while back, I knew I was supposed to start a community to just really welcome any wife where she was, which many wives are where I was, where I'm just like fed up, tired, trying to get him to do what I wanted him to do, my husband, and nothing's working. He's not giving me what I want. So defeated, and I'm done. Years ago... I started on my own journey of like, well, what, how can I be happy in this marriage that I have? Because I don't know how to be. Long story short, that's where a wife like me came from. And the, a wife like me is not me. It was a journal question that I had had. Is there another wife like me who feels this way? Who's so frustrated? Who feels like there's, is this ever going to change? How am I ever going to be happy in this marriage? I don't know what to do. Is there another wife like me? Years later, it was the same question, but it, it different, asked differently really is like, is there another wife like me who now knowing what I now know, like could maybe stay in her marriage and like love her actually truly enjoy who her husband is and herself in that marriage. And like, is it possible? Is there another wife like me who could be where now we are, maybe just doesn't know yet? That's kind of where all of this came from. We have our book, our podcast, blogs, the quiz, the all the things over at A Wife Like Me. So that's where it was all, it all came from that. It's interesting to me because it's so profound on so many levels. I think deep down, we all want a marriage that we see on TV. I do. I mean, I'm sorry. I want 
the Huxtable's relationship. I want that Sergio old I am. That's Cosby Show. I look at these sitcoms. Listen, I know in my head that they're not real. I know that. But I also know growing up what I saw was not what I wanted either. My parents separated in 97. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't want that ever. And then they would end up getting divorced much, much later. And my wife comes from a parents of divorce. And I see friends around me, their parents got divorced. I think from our friend group, there was like 12 of us that kind of all hung out together. I think of that friend group, I think only two of us had a mom and dad that stayed together, that worked it out, that made it work. They were actually happy, maybe. Who knows if they were really happy? We don't know. They seemed like it. We'll say a little shout out to to my friends growing up. I was very fortunate. I grew up in the church and I gravitated towards this family around 96, right before my parents separated. They seriously seemed like Ozzy and Harriet from the Leave it to Beaver show. They had a Wally, you know, an older brother type person who was the older brother I needed and wanted to have. June Cleaver, I mean, Karen is like her. I mean, it just seems so picture perfect. Now, granted, they had problems. They had, I'm sure, issues, but we never saw them as kids. Either they did a really good job of hiding it or they worked it out and we never saw it because they worked it out. And so I think that's what I grew up wanting. And so again, when we kind of got introduced to you, I'm like, man, this is so fascinating to me. I feel like so many people of my generation and and I'm, listen, I'm 43. I'm on my way to 44. I feel like nowadays it's so easy for people of my generation to say, oh, you cheated on me, we're done. Which maybe that should be a thing that you're done. Or you know what? We need to take a trial separation. This is too stressful. This is not, you're not meeting my needs. I'm going to separate from you for a while. We'll figure our stuff out and then we'll come back together again. It just seems like that's a growing trend, at least in people that I'm running across. And so that's why I was so fascinated and, and really intrigued to get to know more about you and what you're about. So I build all that to say, what's the number one thing people should try to fix in their marriage if they feel like like they're in this rough season, this turbulent area. From your experience, what are you seeing that, that people really should focus on or key in on? Oh, I mean, my mind goes in all sorts of directions. I am a Christian. I follow Jesus and I deal primarily with wives. And many husbands aren't following Jesus. There's nothing outside of loving your spouse like Jesus. There's nothing you can do, really. I mean, you've been praying, obviously. You can't force someone into a relationship with Jesus. Being engaged in your faith individually for yourself, like having a relationship with Jesus for yourself. Outside of that, I would say the number one thing that couples can do is, and if you're going to be married or you're planning to be married to somebody, start practicing this all day. I see couples all the time not doing this brutally honest Hmm. about where you're at. Think of this often as like we live near a hospital. I would liken it to the idea of like if there are a bunch of people walking around town or around the grocery store with like stab wounds all over them. It's like in our marriages, we have a bunch of stab wounds, but we're just, we're not even going to the hospital. We're not... (laughs) just, oh, it's fine. It's just, we're not going to go there. We're just not going to talk about it. We're not going to address it. I'm not going to actually tell you I'm not happy how this is. I am not, the way we communicate feels awful and I can't do that anymore. We got to find a different way. The way you make me feel hurts. I will not live in this marriage like that anymore. We've got to change this, whatever the state is, to address it. What happens typically is it doesn't get addressed or you try, but it doesn't go well and you don't actually resolve it. And so then it just stays there unresolved and you're less likely to bring it up again because last time you brought it up, look where that brought you. So then it just stays hidden and you just carry on with your stab wounds with a Band-Aid and thinking it's fine. It's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. Two options. Something will come up, whether it's porn, whether it's an emotional affair, an affair with something. We're just addicted to something. Or like we, we engage outside. Of, we look outside of our marriage for something to make us feel better because our marriage isn't giving us that. It doesn't even have to be a person. That'll happen or you'll just at some point not be together. Instead, like what could happen? And again, this is not perfect because not everyone is married to a healthy person (laughs) and you can't have a healthy relationship with an unhealthy person. So sometimes when you share your brutally honest truth with your spouse, the hope is that they do receive it. Maybe not immediately. Immediately, they might be like completely like shocked and hurt and whatever. The hope is that they'll come around at some point and be like, yeah, okay, like I'm not happy either. 
And I don't want to live in a marriage where we're not happy. That's the hope. And then you can actually start addressing those things. I still go to counseling. My husband and I still go to counseling because I'm not going to think that I, I know. And there are things that I need help talking through even still. And this is what I do all day. And I have a master's in counseling. <laughs> I need help. We need help. To think that we can just figure it out on our own is completely ridiculous because we can't. Or if you go to your spouse and you share your brutally honest truth with them and they're like, yeah, no, or actually I'm not doing anything wrong. You are. I'm going to gaslight you to the moon and back. That's tricky because then you really are faced with next steps of, okay, we need to call in some other people here. Maybe our pastor. I'm going to ask you to just to go count- to go to counseling with me because I've tried to bring this up, but you're not receiving it. And I think we need someone else here to talk into this. I don't want this to change. I need, we need help. That would be the number one thing I think is just address what's not not working. Obviously in that, it's not blaming your spouse. It's just saying like, I'm not happy with this. Like this is not working for us anymore or for me anymore. And we need to find a better way. You need to change this. You need to change it. It's like saying, really? It's like the state of the marriage. This is not great. Or this area is struggling or this area is struggling. Like I desire, I don't think it's wrong. You said the Cosby's. I think it's like, there's this fantasy world. And then the reality, I think we can desire more of the good. There's no reason why your marriage can't be a happy thing in like a great intimate space. It should be. And I think that's very beautiful to desire that. I think we should because it is possible. You just have to have a willing participant to want that same thing who is humble enough to admit that, hey, I can adjust to. That's where it has to start to. I would maybe echo that is that there has to be a willingness to say I was wrong. Yep. And I think there has to be a willingness to say, okay, if I desire to have the things work, I have to start with myself. Maybe once admitting, listen, I I had a part to play in this. Some of the greatest wisdom I ever heard was from a World War II veteran in our church. He walked into most situations in the church and even in his life with the idea, I'm probably wrong in this area. And I thought, and that is so profound. But I walk in thinking, nope, I have all the answers. I know everything that's right. I know everything's right. Everything, everyone else is wrong. But if I walk in thinking, you know what? I'm probably wrong or probably perceive something wrong. Let me see what I can do to make it right. I think that's brilliant. That's what I hear you say in that is the idea of the desire to say, what am I going to say that is, again, brutally honest. Some people don't like that. I'm one of my hands up. I don't love the brutally honest, but I think you do get so much more traction and so much more ability to, to work things out when you just can say, hey, this is where I'm at. Like, let's work this out. Let's throw everything in the middle and let's figure it out. What do you think it takes to continue to have a good marriage? We've kind of talked about maybe some hiccups and some challenges that stops maybe a good marriage from happening. What are some good advice that you're maybe doing in your life that you're like, hey, this is working for us. I bet it might work for you too. What's one area? Area that people could really work towards. So I see busyness as like a huge, huge issue. I mean, across the board in any family today. And it has for sure been an issue in our marriage, especially early on in ministry for me was doing good things. I mean, you know, you're volunteering for here, you're bringing a meal there, you're part of that committee, you help put on that thing. And you know, the list goes on and they're all good things. Going to your kids is that. I just see it over and over. And I've again, experienced it We've experienced it ourselves where we are just making time for everything else. And so then we think, well, we, you know, you know, we spend, we do spend some time together each day where, you know, but after the kids are in bed or whatever, we're we're together. Well, what's different today than it was years ago is that we have a lack of face-to-face time. We aren't sitting across from each other engaged, you know, in your day and your thoughts and your struggles and your joys. Like we're sitting shoulder to shoulder, typically on our devices. So the communication has changed. Then our connection has changed. Then our intimacy has changed changed. I think to maintain a level of health and happiness in a marriage, we have to actually prioritize it, which everybody says, but that actually looks like something. It actually looks like when someone texts you, it actually looks like you responding saying, I'd love to, but I can't. Or for a season when my husband called me out when I was too busy, overcommitted outside of our home, he's like, Amanda, you're gone all the time. I don't like it. If we're okay, I'm fine with it, but we're not okay. This can't not happen. 
happy. We kind of like, again, brutally honest, like this is not working for me anymore. You have to be willing to respond even for a season. I was like, I'd love to, but I'm prioritizing my marriage. And so I have to say no. I literally had to say, because also I think it's beautiful to say, I would love to, I need to have time with my spouse. So therefore it's a no. Um, because what we do is we commit to all these other things. And then what gets placed on the back burner is like the most important thing outside of our relationship with Christ for those who follow Jesus. I'm pretty sure it's your marriage. It's not that youth football league that you're coaching and it's literally taking over. It's ruining your marriage or, you know, your hobby with your cars or your, your friends or whatever that is. Like it's, it's, is it worth losing your family over? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. We have to like admit that is what is going to, it's going to happen. It's a slow burn. We don't like wake up and be like, oh my God, this is what's happened. No, it's like a slow, subtle, moving apart in different directions. Just an apathy, complete apathy toward the other. For us, it literally looks like saying no to our kids too. And that's a weird thing to say, but it does. It looks like my husband farms, so he'll come home. We'll, we'll typically sit in this one little room that we have and we'll be talking and one of our kids will come in and be like, mom or dad. And we'll be like, mm, you need to wait, mom and dad are talking. You need to respect that we are talking right now and this matters. Like we, we matter. So you need to wait. I mean, that might sound rude, but that is what we do. And I think that's a good lesson for them. Like, hold on, like mom and dad are engaged in a conversation or at night after we've put them to bed and we're talking and they'll bust on in our room and be like, uh, 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 <laughs> no, this is our time. No. And so I think that we also need to learn what that again, practically looks like in our day to day, even just the interruptions when, when, you know, spouses are engaged in something, conversation, date, or just to care, just to care and show each other, like, I am for you. I have your back. I care about what you want to say. I'm tuned in and everything else can wait kind of thing, including all the, all the extracurriculars. That's kind of a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> my wife and I will be engaged in a conversation and immediately my daughter comes into the room and she's like, Hey, so, uh, you know, and then I'm like, get a little bugged because my time is now being sucked away. I will say for me, it was really hard when I first kicked off my podcast. I was just so focused day in and day out, like 24 seven, just always thinking of the next episode, the next guest, the next, whatever I would do. I was thinking that like I have to post to social media seven times a day and all this other nonsense that is just dumb and silly. Oh, I got to go check to see how many downloads I got. It became all encompassing, all consuming, all everything. I'd wake up early. I would kick away devotional time, quiet time with God to, to research the next guest or again to find that next person. And it got to the point where my wife's like, I think you care more about the show than anything else. Yeah, what's wrong with that? I'm trying to do this. Even back in August, we were on a camping trip. They went to the lake and they did all this other stuff. And I actually stayed at our campsite and I slept almost the whole day. My wife came back at night and she what's going on? Are you, are you okay? And I said, I think my mind just needed to rest. And she said, tell me more about that. And I said, so much thinking about the show and work and all this other stuff. Like my mind is just so full of what I have to do next. I said, I was just exhausted. And she said, so how many times have you thought about the show just today? And I said, I haven't. And she said, wow, when's the last time that happened? Mm. And I said, I don't know. It's been a while. That's what I'm hearing again. You say is the idea of it's okay to pause. It's okay to say not right now. This I'm pointing to you and I, if you were my spouse, this is more important in this moment. You're more important in this yeah. moment. Not me looking at my notifications, not me checking my watch, not me checking all this other stuff. Oh, I got to, I got to check this email. That one email, is it really going to be that much more important if you respond to it five minutes? from now or an hour from now or 20 minutes. I'm sorry. You're not that important that your email needs to be that time sensitive. You're just not. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. You're not. Yeah so many times as a society, we think, oh, the busier I am, the more important I am. And then this older lady in the church one day said to me, she said, back then I was a pastor. She said, you know, Pastor Neil, busy means being under Satan's yoke. Are you really that busy? I'm like, oh, Margaret, God bless you for saying that, but I don't like you for saying that. But if somebody's feeling the yoke of that, the yoke of busyness, the yoke of everything's more important than my spouse, if they continue down that road, I mean, I know you're not a psychic or a prognosticator of groundhogs in winter and whether it's spring or not. Again, maybe the obvious answer is it's dangerous, but have you seen that walked out in people's lives if they don't get a handle on this? Oh, absolutely. I see it all the time. I mean, and it could have, it could be any of us who have yourself and thankfully like you were on a camping trip away from the usual and you're able to see it. I think a lot of the time we just don't see it or we, we write it off for something else. I'm invested in that Kiwanis club or I don't know, whatever it is. We justify our lack of intention and lack of commitment toward our 
our spouse. The things we're doing do make sense to us. And I think all those things are amazing. Boundaries are like my flavor of the day. I love a good boundary. So I am all for you need to take care of yourself in all the ways, spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, all the things. And after that, if your marriage relationship is not doing well, there should not be any extra time for other things. Take care of yourself, whatever that needs to look like. Take care of your marriage, whatever that needs to look like. And if after that, there's not any spare time left, then there's no spare time left. Everything else has been coming first for so many of us. And I mean, we see it all the time. It destroys marriages. Again, it's not like this big explosion of like, oh my gosh, there's an, you know, an affair. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it's subtle. And like, you're like, I don't even know, but we're not happy. I don't even know what happened, but we're just not on the same page anymore. This is why we lost that communication and connection over time. And now we're just like, I don't even know who we are anymore. And I'm not happy and he's not happy. And what happened? And I think that's why affairs happen. I think that's why divorces happen. To get your eyes off of where they need to be. It's so easily distracted. That's maybe why I love magic so much as a kid. The magic trick happens and you're like, man, how did that happen? I want to know that. And yeah, I'm being a little facetious there on some level. The friends that I've known that have struggled in their marriage and even myself when I've struggled in my marriage, it's when my eyes have been focused on something else rather other than her. And I think the hard part in that is even when our eyes are maybe on our spouse, oftentimes if we're honest, we're like, yeah, I don't even like what I see though. That That's the tricky part. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier is put your eyes on your spouse and you're like, you're a jerk. You are mean. You this, you that. Well, then what a great time to start investing there and figure out what's going on. Yeah. that That's not always easy to look at your spouse either. Because you don't like it. You don't like what's going on. So then let's do something about it. Easy to sit and be critical of anyone else. And rare is it ever that we look back at ourselves. I mean, the old adage, when I'm pointing at you, there's three fingers pointing at, back at me. If I'm going to look for a flaw in someone else and point out their flaw and say, listen, you're doing this or you always do that. I mean, the all encompassing words, you never listen, you never do this, you always do. I better be looking back at myself back in the mirror. What's the danger in that if I don't? Do you feel like? Well, I mean, outside of completely being having lack of humility and just being full of pride, <laughs> I mean, that's I mean not the gonna... obvious ones. <laughs> it's how I spent the first ten years of of my relationship with my husband. Just like he sucks, he's not giving me what I want. He, he was amazing, P.S. But not to the standard I wanted him to be in. I had way different expectations. I've been there, done that. It's so painful because really, while a lot of that may be true, it might be that you are married to a jerk and that needs to be addressed. So there is that reality. Oftentimes there's an element to what we are experiencing that is truth. You know, your tone, Amanda, feels very disrespectful when you talk to me. There's a reality there for my husband. At the same time, he can acknowledge his experience in our marriage and also be reflecting on and want to know, have a genuine desire to want to know what his part. So there's like, it's a both and. Again, it goes back to in order to have a deep, meaningful, intimate relationship, both spouses, they have to be willing to share and receive hard things. We have to both say, that doesn't feel good. You know, it feels like whatever, fill in the blank. Like when you say it like that, or when you do that to me, it feels so disrespected or unseen or unappreciated because I care about us and I want a healthy, happy marriage. I want to know what I can do differently. If we don't do that, I mean, honestly, good luck finding anyone for a long period of time who will make you happy because nobody will. So fascinating to me, again, going back to the quiz, is it did clue me in more to what my wife is maybe dealing with. And so it really kind of gave me another glimpse into her world and a glimpse into how I can best serve her. Notice how I said that, how I can best serve her, not her serve me, really serve her in that way. And and that's what I love most about it, that I'm learning through that quiz. Help me with this. If somebody right now is, is listening to us right now, as we talk about our marriages and they're like, listen, that's cool that you guys have had some challenges. That's cool. I mean, that's fine. Like nobody's perfect. Come on. Hallmark tricks us into thinking that we can have this amazing marriage, whatever. It's not Christmas time yet, but it's on the horizon. I don't know if I really believe you, Amanda. Can I really have a really good marriage if I take your quiz or if I do these things? What would be your response back to that? Again, I think, you know, everything that, (laughs) everything that we talk about at A Wife Like Me is 
self focus. So like, what can we do? Like you're talking about, what can I do to be healthy, to take next steps in my own faith? What can I do to grow in my own communication? What are my weaknesses? What are my blind spots? How am I? Is my faith like an appetizer or a side dish? And am I really just operating in what I want to be like and really neglecting the way of Jesus here? It comes down to like, you cannot control your spouse. You can only control yourself. So what am I going to do? And I follow Jesus. Like when I meet him, I want to know confidently. I literally, with your help, Lord, feel like I did the best I could with like who you gave me. I want to love my husband well. What does that even look like? And so focusing on that more than our our husband, if you're a guy listening more than your wife, like focus on what you can do and ask them even what they would like and all that. So just care about that. Care about your own growth and focus on your own growth. That's the painful thing. You cannot make your spouse care or want to do the same, but you can do that and just see what happens. And and you can engage in meaningful conversation and say like, I really want to grow. I really want to move forward. But the brutal, the brutal truth is you just, you cannot guarantee anything, but it is possible. It's so possible, but you, it does require work. And a lot of times we just don't have energy or we don't want to. It is oftentimes so worth it. So that's what I would say. Put in the work and see what happens. Pushback would be, listen, I'm going to do all this work. I'm going to commit for the next, let's say, six months. I'm going to give this six months. I'm going to put it in the work. I'm going to trick my wife into somehow taking this test. Most women love to take the 17 magazine quiz. Come on. Remind her of that and she'll probably take it again. Take that, men. I'm speaking to the guys here. Take that and digest it. Just dig into it and ask yourself this question. If in six months my marriage doesn't look any better, blame Amanda. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. (laughs) But if a guy really says, okay, I'm going to commit to six months, the next six months, I'm going to do everything in my power to follow and learn. And, you know, I've heard it said, love, dare. I mean, that, that was a fun book back a while back. And I had a bunch of guys around me doing that. And they got to like day 10 in the love den. They're like, man, like I I can't keep going. And it's like, what? (laughs) Why? why? Well, man, it's hard. Well, yeah, Yeah. you're a knucklehead. It's hard. She's married to you. And I'm a knucklehead too. Sometimes that's what I'm saying is, is if somebody really genuinely gave this six months, do you really feel like, again, regardless of the result, which I've been telling my daughter, this, you got to give to get, which my wife hates that phrasing. But I think if you really gave with the intention of saying, listen, there's nothing I want back. I don't want to get anything back in return. I just want to give, not again, expecting something back, but to give, I really think marriages could potentially be changed, saved. Am I wrong in this? I mean, I know it's not a miracle worker and you're not a miracle worker. Could do some really good. Oh, for sure. (laughs) For sure it could. Yeah. And you know, the scary part is I, I get pushed back a lot from men and women saying, so what I hear you saying, Amanda, is I'm just supposed to love my spouse and it's gonna be better. People will ask that and like, and not expect anything in return. That's the part. What you're saying is he doesn't or she doesn't have to do anything back and I'm just supposed to be great and nice and kind and like loving. That's what you're saying. And it's interesting because it just reveals like our human nature of, mm-hmm. you know, at the core of me, I'm scared because I might get hurt. Like I might get, I might get left in the dust and they might not actually reciprocate. I might actually be told again that fill in the blank. Like I'm not that important. They don't really care. Something else matters more. And that's scary. And I think, again, it goes back to who the heck are we anyway? And why would we even want to do a love there? It really isn't fun if we're doing it out of a reluctant heart. I don't really want to do this. And sometimes it changes our heart in the process. Really, like it comes back to why are we even putting any energy or effort into any of this at all? Why would I care to love my spouse for six months straight and like whatever? But also I want to say when we're talking pouring into your spouse, like saying, okay, I'm going to commit to my spouse and just seeing what comes from it. Part of that also is saying hard things. I think, especially in the Christian world, we do not understand that, nor do we practice that well. Being loving is actually calling out what isn't working or what isn't kind, what is hurtful. I see this a lot in men specifically, that they're almost afraid to be honest with, especially an influencer wife, where we are tend to be dominant and we externally process and we're sharp with our words and causes a more soft spoken man to kind of shrink back and be like, okay, never mind. Just pretend I didn't say anything. I don't want to cause any conflict. So uh." when you say I'm going to just for six months, I'm going to sacrifice and love. 
I say heck to the yes. And part of that actually does include loving your spouse enough to be brutally honest. So do the love dare, do all the things, just sacrificially love your spouse. Yes. And be kind in saying lovingly what's hurtful and not working. Yes. They'll experience your love and they'll, they'll know the truth of their behaviors towards you. So it doesn't mean you just like shut up and take their crap or I'm with wives all day long. There are mean spouses, men and women. They're just mean. And so it does not mean like to do a love dare or to sacrificially love your spouse for six months. That does not mean you're a doormat. It means you actually have a voice to, to say like, I love myself and I love you enough to say that hurt or whatever that looks like in your marriage. So yes, I would say go for it. Cause what do you, what can you lose? What can you lose? I think so much of marriage turns into this competition. You get this, I should get this. You got to go do that. Well, now I should get to go do that. I know I've been there a time or two. And I think if I set the competition aside and focus on being the servant, again, giving to just get her to understand, giving to get her to understand how I'm feeling, I think could be truly powerful. Yes. Big thing I want to say, each spouse is too, you have to have a level of respect. Usually you're obviously both different. My husband and I completely different. And that's typical. The problem comes in is when one spouse doesn't respect mm. the differences of the other spouse. So for example, I am an extrovert. I love people. I literally will go crazy. Like I feel legit like I'm going to be just itchy. Like if I don't get to laugh, get out of the house and do something, you don't want to be around me. Like, And I'm not giving excuses for like gratitude. My husband knows that about me. A different need for seeing people than he does. He could be happy home all day long. It's not a problem when we each respect how we are each different. It is a problem anytime a spouse does not respect how their spouse is made, the other spouse is made, created, and what their needs are. So if we can respect like, hey, I want you to be happy. What do you need to be well and thriving? This is what I need. What do you need? What does that look like? How can we help each other get there? Have you thought about making a husband quiz? <laughs> I haven't. I'm asking genuinely for my friend Zach again, tweeted me like, hey, what about the husband quiz? And I ask in, in sincerity because I wonder if it would unlock some things for guys. I could envision, again, I'm not vision casting over your ministry or what you're a part of, but I would envision <laughs> like the, the wife takes it. This is what I'm seeing. The wife takes it. The husband takes it. They come together maybe at a coastal getaway with no kids, no cell phones, and they sit down on the bed together and they just say, let's dive into this together. And I I think the greatest thing that I've ever heard someone say is, wow, I, I didn't know you felt that way too. I thought I was alone in feeling that. That to me is one of the most powerful statements I've ever heard someone utter. Just brings so much clarity. You thought you were alone. You thought you were the only wife that maybe has ever dealt with this. Well, the reality is you're not. I don't know. Just a, just a question for the, for the fan club. Good. I like it. I'll consider that. <laughs> Thanks right. for your vision. You're welcome. Well, Amanda, how can people take the quiz? I mean, we've kind of been talking about it. And I think you mentioned it a little bit. What's the best way? Where can somebody connect with you if they want to know more about how to be the best wife they can ever be? Take this amazing quiz that so many that I know have taken it, at least three that I know of, and hopefully more. Anyway, how can they do that? Where, where's the best place? So you can just go to a wife like me.com or if you follow us on Instagram, our handle is a wife like me. And then in our bio, there's a link provides everything. So you can take the quiz, you can get our book, Dear Wife, which I highly recommend. Get it for your wife or wives. Just get that. You can head to our blog, our podcast, YouTube channel, all the things. So just check that out. And then everything we have is on our website or over on Instagram. So the wife book, I should get that is, is what you're telling me? Get it. Okay. For your wife. Through the website or is it like on Amazon, all those other fun places? Yep. Through the website. Again, a wife like me.com. Amazon, just Google or search Dear Wife. Here's the wacky part. I mean, you're my much younger than I am. And I get it. You know, you're nervous being here today. You're you're not really used to speaking in front of people and on podcasts. I mean, it's not like you do it all the time or anything. You know, maybe in your nervousness, you did forget one place folks can go and get it as well. And that's okay. They can also go to opspodcast.com slash books that I love. It'll be up kind of towards the top. It'll be featured there as well. So yes. And I have to say about our book, it's so good. because We created the book based on the number one need 
need that wives had. So we surveyed over 3,000 wives. 87% had the same number one desire in marriage, which is, do you know what it is? Can you guess? I was just going to say, I'm trying to guess what it might be, but I don't know if you're going to tell us or tease us on it. So I don't know. Number one thing, I'm going to go with security. I mean, no, but that would be really good. need and desire in marriage for wives is deeper connection. Wow. They want to connect. They feel disconnected. Okay. Yeah. The book, it's 10 minute invitations to create connection with your husband and with God. So like you, it's like a devotional, but then oh, man, 10 minutes. I got to give 10 minutes a day. Oh. Your wife. It's for oh, her. Right. Right. It's for her. Right. And, back to her. And she's challenged to go to you as the husband and create connection in a particular, so that she's like challenged to now go to your husband and do X, Y, Z. So to create connection. So it's actually really cool. I like her doing all the work and I just sit on the couch. Is that, (laughs) that's not in the book. (laughs) You lose. (laughs) (laughs) Ah. Well, Amanda, thanks so much. Before I let you go, I do want to say truly, thank you. Thank you for what you shared today. I really mean it. I I felt like we had a lot of fun. I felt like it was exciting. Thank you. And it's my pleasure. Really, it is. If anyone has like difficulties, just again, email us at info at a wife like me.com because marriage is hard. It's not always easy. So we're here for you. Marriage is the toughest job you'll ever have. I don't care if you're a Marine or not. It's the toughest job you'll ever have. Well, Amanda, before we let you go, I like to do some silliness. If you're in the mood for some silliness before we let you go, is that all right? Always. Yes. So we do this thing at the end of the show called senseless. It's these random six questions and I have a cup standing by. I know you're not a big sports fan. People have told me that. I mean, it's, it's getting around this year specifically. Maybe you could just say a little prayer for our beloved Tar Heels. I know it's weird out here in Oregon. We should root for Oregon. We don't. So anyway, so here's my cup and there's a die in there. As you can see, I'm going to roll it for you. One handed rolling. This is, this is amazing. All right. So you got question number two. There's proof. Number two. And it is revealing this two people you want to hug. Oh my land. And I can't say Jesus. Can I say Jesus? I mean, that (laughs) seems like the obvious answer. We could stretch. Come on. You got, you can stretch that. Oh man. Two people I want to hug. I don't even know. You know, okay. It's fun fact. I am a hugger. So I hug everyone. That's funny. And we didn't know that. I'm thinking like, who have I not hugged that I would like to hug? I mean, if it helps, they can be dead or alive. Maybe there's a past relative that you're like, ah, uh, Mima, I want to hug Mima one more time. And for sure. Then my grandma, for sure. And I know we're going to get off and I'll be like, Amanda, really? You didn't think of that person? So my dad was just, I'll just say my dad, he lives in Colorado, so I don't get to see him often. And he was diagnosed with dementia recently. And so I would totally hug him all day long right now because I don't get to see him. It's so dumb. <laughs> yeah. Colorado to Minnesota. That's that's not an easy flight, I would imagine. It is not an awful flight, you know. And then he can't drive because of dementia now and whatever. So I would say him and my grandma, who is like Jesus in human form. Wow. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, that's it. That's all. Dearly beloved, marriage, it's what brings us together to die. Seems appropriate there. Listen, I celebrated 22 years back in August on the 18th and my wife and I went to dinner and she asked me a really hard question. Usually I'm the one asking hard questions, so it's not very nice and fair when people do it to me. She asked me, she said, what would you change about our wedding day? And guys and gals, I froze. I was like, what do you mean? Tell me more. (laughs) Bail me out here. I want to ask you a question. Can you do me a favor? If you're married right now, will you just look down at that left hand of yours? What does that ring mean to you? What does it symbolize? Just take a moment and look. Does it have diamonds? Great. What are the facets of those diamonds? Look into it deeply. As you do that, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is there anything you would trade for that diamond ring or that wedding band of yours if you're a guy? What's something you would trade for it? I bet you the answer is probably nothing. So if that's the case, there's nothing you would trade. There's nothing you would give up for it. What are you doing to build into it? That's my question for you today as we get out of here today. And remember this, don't forget... Don't ever forget, remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.